So let's get into it. We are going to do a full recap on Sean P. Diddy Combs, Puff Daddy, so many names he went by. Like I said, huge trigger warning for this because there's so many things he's being charged with. There's so many things that are now coming out that people didn't know before. And all of it is horrendous. Some more grotesque than other things, but it's it's all just as bad. I want to go back to last November when this kind of all got started. There have been rumors about Diddy and what he's been up to forever, as you guys know. And a lot of people suspect that he had a hand in Tupac's murders. There's other murders that people have rumored that he's been involved in. There's been lots of stuff. But the main thing that started this all off was Cassie. His ex, Cassie, came forward, filed a lawsuit. And that's basically what, in my opinion, got all of this rolling. Everything just kind of seemed to get swept under the rug until then. So we know that in November of 2023... Cassie, who was his former girlfriend, she was with him from 2007 until 2018. It's Cassandra Ventura. She went ahead and filed a civil lawsuit. The statute of limitations, unfortunately, is over. So police can't do anything about these, these cases. Like it's, it's too late, which, which is a crime in itself. But Cassie came forward, filed a civil lawsuit, and basically accused him of abusing her sexually and physically. Under the New York's Adult Survivors Act, adult victims were able to come forward for a timeline of a year, no matter what the statute of limitations was, to file civil suits. So she took advantage of that one year. Thank goodness that came out. And that's when she filed. So she came forward. She filed it. She basically said that he forced himself on her sexually, um, beat her in fits of what she called uncontrollable rage and exerted a really tight hold over her life. That's a direct quote from her legal documents. So basically she was just alleging that he controlled every aspect of her life. She said that she was being made to perform sex acts with other men who were usually hired men. And as you guys know, Diddy called them freak offs. So a lot of times these men were paid to come over, do these things with Cassie while he video recorded and usually ended up apparently pl pleasuring himself and enjoying himself while he watched, sometimes taking part. And apparently it was all on, on record. It was all videotaped. Now, once Cassie did this, apparently she had threatened him that she was going to be doing this and he didn't do anything about it called her like a money grabber and all this stuff. She did. She filed it. And the very next day, like within hours of her filing, he settled. So we don't know how much money she got. I'm assuming there's probably was an NDA signed, like who knows, uh, but he settled. Now, we know because of um, Tony Busby, who is now the attorney that's coming forward with like 120 victims, he has said that when victims come forward with civil suits like this, the proper practice is you go to the person first, the accused, and if they want to settle out of court, they can do that and then nothing gets released. So it makes sense why Diddy tried to settle this as soon as it was filed, um, but it was too late. It was already filed, so we got the documentation. But what's happening now with a lot of the other victims is the people that are going to be charged, like all of these other celebrities, do have the option of settling outside of court and then we may never know who it was and what they did. Anyway, we're going to get into all that uh, um, as we keep going. So because Cassie came forward, it was like a ripple effect. All these other people started coming forward. Now, once Cassie filed her lawsuit, people were able to read it and she made a lot of accusations. What ended up happening, as you guys all know, is a video recording was released and it was from a hotel where Cassie is seen running down a hallway. Diddy comes out behind her with nothing but a towel on. She gets to the elevator. She's trying to leave. He grabs her. He throws her to the ground. He's kicking her. He's throwing things at her. Like it was horrendous. She's on the phone at one point trying to call like the front desk. What has come out now is apparently he ended up paying off the hotel to give him the recording. There must've been another recording because something got leaked. He personally thinks it's the feds who leaked it. 
I don't know. Uh, but the video came out and it basically proved everything that Cassie said in her lawsuit was actually true. Now, the next lawsuit that came out was November 23rd. So it literally was days after Cassie filed hers. And it was by Joy Dickerson Neal. She filed one day before the Adult Survivors Act expired, the New York Adult Survivors Act that was allowing like a year to, to do this, no matter the statute of limitations. So she filed one day before this and she said that Cassie had inspired her to do so. She alleges that Diddy drugged her and took her to where he was staying. She said that she lacked all physical ability to fight him off because something was going on, like she was drugged, like something, something happened. She doesn't know what he gave her, but she was out of it. She said that he sexually assaulted her and that a male friend of hers told her that Combs had taped it and actually showed his buddies. So some guys she knew said that they had watched Diddy do this to her. The next person was the very next day, November 24th, and it was um, Lisa, I believe, believe her name is, it's L-I-Z-A, Gardner. Now she filed on the very last day of the Survivors Act, and she says that he did this to her when she was 16 years old, like just a kid. She says it was in 90 or 91, so he was like at the height of his career, like Mr. Cool, right? All these, these kids, like a 16 year old would have been like, oh my God, it's Diddy, right? She said that she and a friend met him and R&B singer um, Aaron Hall. They were at an event in Manhattan and she and her friend met them there. Afterwards, they were invited back to Hall's apartment with Combs. Diddy was going as well. And she said that the two of them were offered drinks and they accepted and they got either drugged or hammered. They don't really know what it was, but they were not themselves. Uh, she says that Diddy coerced her into the bedroom and ended up convincing her or coercing her into having sex. She said that she was shocked and traumatized after she was only 16 years old. Um, she basically feels like, you know, she had to do this. Um, and she said after this happened that Aaron Hall barged into the room and pinned her down and sexually assaulted her after Diddy had done this. So both men took advantage of her that night. She was 16. The next filing, um, when the next filing came in, it was from a Jane Doe. So this woman didn't want to be named. And this was in December of 2023. So just last December, like a month, not even a month, just days after um, the other lawsuits had come forward. Now she says that she was 17 years old and Combs was 34 when this took place with her in 2003. So no name for her. She filed the lawsuit alleging that basically it was a gang situation. So it was not just him. There was multiple men. And she said that there was like sex trafficking happening at this time by Combs and Harvey Pierre. So Harvey Pierre at the time was his former longtime president of his record label. So he was right in this apparently, allegedly with Combs. So she says that she met them at a lounge in Detroit and Combs convinced her to travel to New York on a private jet. So this is where the trafficking comes into place because you're sex trafficking across um, different states and it's illegal. Like you, can, you can't do that. So anyway, here's, here's what she's alleging. She says that she gets invited to go on Diddy's private jet to New York. She's 17 years old. She's freaking out. She's so excited because he's this famous musician. So she agrees. But as they're leaving the club, this Harvey Pierre basically smokes crack in front of her and then forces her to go down on him before they even leave the club. And she said she felt like she had to do it. She wanted to get on the jet with Diddy. She was so excited. And it was just a horrible situation for a 17 year old girl to be in. Then it gets worse for her. She says they get on the private jet. She's totally in awe of what's happening. They end up getting to New York. And she says that she was taken to a studio there um, and given copious, this is her words, copious amounts of drugs and alcohol and that there were other men there. She says that three men ended up taking turns, having their way with her in the bathroom after she was too out of it to basically defend herself or get out of the situation. She said she was completely out of it. And then afterwards, instead of, you know, taking care of her or making sure she's okay, Diddy just gave her to somebody to ship her off on a plane to send her back to New to Detroit from New York. So she didn't even go back on the jet with him. Like he just discarded her afterwards. 
like horrible. So she ends up back in Michigan. So those are the first couple lawsuits that came out. The next lawsuit was kind of a big one. It was in February. So it was two months later. And this is the one that Rodney Jones filed. They call him Little Rod. He actually worked for Diddy and lived with Diddy for quite a while. So his lawsuit came out and he basically said that Combs and Associates, so he says it was multiple people, engaged in serious illegal activity was his terminology. And he's given receipts apparently that the feds all have now. So this is a big one for him. So he actually worked as a producer on the latest album that Diddy had. And he also lived and traveled with Diddy. They were super tight. So he says he did this from September 2022 until November of 2023, which is kind of an important date because November is when Cassie came out with her lawsuit. So I just feel like Cassie may have given Rodney Jones like the guts to get out and then file his own. So he left in November as Cassie's stuff was coming out. He says that he was sexually harassed by Combs, pressured to engage in sexual acts, forced to get sex workers and hire them for Combs, and that he witnessed Combs giving drinks that were laced with drugs to people at all of his parties. This is what he's laid out. He also says that Diddy basically made him his like videographer. He had to video everything Diddy was doing because Diddy liked to have himself video, video recorded no matter what he was doing. So Rodney Jones claims he's got everything on tape. He gave like still shots of these recordings, apparently to the FBI, to the feds, and apparently the recording. So we don't know what's out there, but it sounds like there's a lot. Now, he says, again, Combs made him record him constantly. He gave screenshots and he actually recorded all of these parties where Diddy is seen like giving lace drinks and all this stuff to underage women, to sex workers, you name it. It's all apparently documented. He also says that Combs, he believes, was trying to groom him into a sexual relationship. This is his, his wording. He felt that he was basically being groomed by Diddy. He says that he was sexually harassed and assaulted while he lived with him in Florida, LA, New York, and on a yacht that Diddy rented in the US Virgin Islands. He's listed all of these accounts in his um, paperwork and his filings. He also said that he and Brandon Paul, we'll get into Brandon Paul in just a sec, but he says that he and Brandon Paul were asked to travel with the drugs and firearms that Diddy wanted to bring. He didn't want to get caught with it, so he had these guys working that were working for him who were younger and you know, on his, his payroll, do it for him. So he wanted stuff with him. He got these guys to carry it. Um, he also says that he is now accusing, Com or sorry, I should say in additional filings, that they're accusing Combs and his sons of being involved in a 2022 shooting at an LA recording studio. I'm not gonna cover a lot in that just now because I haven't dug into that enough, but that's another filing that was filed around that time. The next one that happened, the next big kind of, bombshell that hit was March. And I'm sure all of you remember this. Just this patch, past March is when Homeland Security raided Diddy's homes. At the time, this was like, well, a month after Rodney Jones had come forward, but months since Cassie had come forward. So really, we didn't think anything was coming from these. We just thought there were lawsuits. Now we know more. So the feds decided, Homeland Security decided to raid Diddy's home and get everything that they could um, based on what these charges have now come out to be. Okay, so this is March. So his properties in Miami, LA, and New York all get raided. They found guns, of course, um, on the property, but we didn't have a lot of other details at that time. We now know that there was a lot more found and we've been told a few things. I think the one that stood out to me the most and probably everybody else was the thousand bottles of lube that was found, this baby oil. I am gonna kind of preface uh, one of the assaults that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, but we now know that there's a woman who's come forward um, just this past week. She has said that when Diddy assaulted her, it was like a gang style situation as well. There were multiple men doing this to her, but she says that he showed up with this like fanny pack, this really big fanny pack. And he, she says he pulled out a bottle of some sort of liquid. She said at the time she didn't know what it was and he rubbed it all over her before they assaulted her. So it sounds like this is what he was using with this baby oil. He liked them to be like covered in baby oil. Anyway, we're gonna talk more about that in a few minutes, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on that right now. Okay. So in the raid, 
What ended up happening is when they raided the homes, we saw some of two of Diddy's sons coming out of one of the homes. So they were in one of the homes. Diddy wasn't home. And a lot of people at the time thought that he was trying to take off, that he was fleeing. He wasn't. It was actually a scheduled trip that he was taking to the Bahamas. And they found him. They stopped him at the Miami airport because they knew where he was and where he was going. It was scheduled. So they go, the, the feds go to the Miami airport. They get him. He's not arrested. They're seizing his electronics. So they got his cell phones. However, when they were there, it appears that they did look in some of the bags because they arrested Brendan Paul, who I just spoke about with Rodney Jones. They arrested Brendan Paul and they charged him because he had drugs on him. So they seized his phones. Um, his lawyers, of course, were saying this was all meritless as this was coming out. They were like, oh, this isn't, this isn't true. There's, there's nothing to this. There's no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of these allegations, yada, yada, yada. But Brendan Paul, who at the time was 25 years old, gets arrested at the airport with Diddy. And they said in his travel bags that he was charged with possession of suspected cocaine and marijuana candy, which I'm assuming is gummies. And he was bonded out the next day. I'm sure Diddy probably paid that. Um, so that is one of the people in Rodney Jones's legal um, filing, his suit, that he said Diddy was getting him to carry the drugs and weapons, if you recall. And then a month later, Brendan Paul all of a sudden is arrested and charged because he's got this stuff on him. To me, it just solidifies the fact of what Rodney Jones was saying, that he was made to do this stuff and Brendan Paul was another one. And now Brendan Paul is getting charged for it. Okay, um, then April hits. So the very next month, and we have another allegation. Now this one, um, I don't know how to say her last name, guys. It's Grace, and it's O apostrophe M A R C A I G H, Omar Omarka. Anyway, I'm just going to call her Grace because I, I don't want to mutilate her last name. Um, but Grace comes forward in April, and she actually alleges in a lawsuit that Christian Combs, so Diddy's son, she says that he drugged and assaulted her while working on a yacht that Diddy had chartered, and she was working on it. She wasn't you know, a passenger. She wasn't hanging out. She wasn't a guest. She was actually working there, and this was in 2022. So now it's coming out that not just Dad did this, but that apparently the sons are involved in this as well. So Christian is also dealing with this. So she says that this was in 2022, and she says that she put in evidence or submitted evidence that includes transcripts of audio from a recording that some producer that was on the boat had, and it is her on the tape telling Diddy's son to back off and leave her alone. And then she says whatever happened, the drugs or the drink or whatever they had given her kicks in and she says that she was assaulted. So she she's on tape, like recorded on video, telling him to get away and turning down his advances as he's groping her. And then she succumbs to whatever she was given and she gets assaulted. So she came out with that in April. Then in May, another month later, we had another woman come out against Diddy. And this was Crystal McKinney. So Crystal McKinney alleges that in 2003, she says she was 22 years old. And she said she went to a men's fashion week event in New York City. She says when she was there, she met Combs and he invited her back to his studio. Again, everybody that comments and says like, why would they go? It's Diddy. He was huge. I mean, everybody knew who he was. He was huge in the music industry and people get starstruck, unfortunately, and their safety comes second. Like they don't put that in their head. It's almost like you feel like you know them because they're famous. But anyway, he invited her back to his studio and she says that he and several colleagues were there drinking and smoking something. So she actually said that she got the joint and took a couple hauls off it. And she said she doesn't know what it was, but it basically knocked her on her ass. She said that whatever was in that made her feel like she's never felt before. She said that she took it and everything was just spinning. She felt like she was going to pass out. She felt like she was floating, like it was messed. What happened next though, is she said that Combs demanded that she go into the bathroom. He seems to have this like trend with the bathrooms. A lot of the women's in these claims are saying that this stuff took place in the bathroom with him. But anyway, um, she alleges that he made her go into the bathroom and began kissing her and shoved her head down and basically told her to suck it. Um, and she says that she remembers trying to fight him even though she was so out of it. She was trying to like 
get away from him and get back up, but she was just like out of it. And she says that she refused. Um, and then he pushed her head down again and was forcing her to do this to him. And she says she started to walk away, but then she felt kind of woozy and she lost consciousness. She says the next thing that she remembers is waking up in a taxi and realizing that she'd been sexually assaulted. That's all she remembers. It's horrible. Now, those are the big ones that came out. Then the arrest happens. Everyone was pretty shocked again by this. That's when everything started to come out about the raids from Homeland Security. Diddy gets put into prison. Um, and Homeland comes out with some of the stuff they found from the property, which included the thousand bottles of baby oil. He's still in prison. He's tried three times now to get paroled, like to pay, to pay bond, to get out on bail. And he's been declined because of the prosecution listing all of the things he's done. And it's so horrendous. And they're worried he's going to tamper with witnesses. So they're keeping him where he is. Now, when he tried to get out on bond, he made a big list of all the things he was going to do just to get out because he doesn't want to be in prison, obviously. He said that he was going to sign his jet. He actually gave them a written letter promising to sell the jet. He gave them um, his word or whatever we want to call it, that he was not going to have any females at his home outside of family, that his private um, security team was going to basically babysit him and they would keep a log of whatever he does and report back to the feds as if you can like believe or trust his private security team. But anyway, um, he also said that he would give up his passport and his family members also, some of his family members also agreed to that. Didn't matter. They've all turned this down. He's tried three times now. He, he's in prison. Now, here's where it gets even crazier. Once he was in prison, everything kind of came out. All of these people over God knows how many years, right? Like 20, 30 years, whatever it's been, are now coming forward saying he did the same thing to me. As you can imagine, where there's a few, there's a ton. So these parties that he had now are coming out as being just, he did the same thing to me. As you can imagine, where there's a few, there's a ton. So these parties that he had now are coming out as being just like a breeding ground for all of this horribleness that was going on. Like every, everything's just, it's horrendous. So let's get into this. Basically the feds came forward and this is what they said. They said that he has abused, threatened, and coerced women and others, led a racketeering conspiracy with sex trafficking and transportation to engage in prostitution. Okay? So this sex trafficking that they're talking about is crossing state lines with sex workers. So as we said, Rodney Jones even accused him that he would allegedly hire these male prostitutes and female prostitutes and then he'd want them to go to parties with him. So he'd load them all on his private jet and go to wherever he was going with these sex workers. And you can't do that. It's trafficking. So he's being charged for that, um, which is a huge, huge felony with major time involved, as you can imagine. Uh, but the rest of it, of course, is all part of it as well. Like the racketeering, they're going to get them on a lot. They just couldn't get them on the exact charges of the assaults because time has gone by statute of limitations, unfortunately. Okay. Tony Busby. This is the big wig lawyer who has now come forward. He basically put up a bloody billboard with his phone number and was like, if you've been abused by Diddy, call me. And man, did they ever. He said they had over 3000 people calling and alleging that they were victimized by Diddy. Now, yes, there's going to be people in there that are just looking for a payday and they're full of crap. Um, of course, but he's only chosen right now 120 that he was able to vet properly. So he's listed the process of vetting this. And he says they dug into all these cases and they had to have like evidence like crazy for him to take this on. That's why he's only taken 120. He claims they've got um, witnesses. They've got evidence. They've got videos. They've got photographs. They've got police reports and hospital reports from some of these victims. So he's got apparently major evidence backing him for 120 of these cases. The rest he didn't take on. Now here's the sad, the sad part of that. You can pretty much guarantee that a ton of those 3000 victims were actually telling the truth, but they just didn't have enough evidence to move forward in the case. 
Like it can't be a he said, she said, or they're not going to take it on. So a lot of those people probably didn't go to the police, didn't go to the hospital. They don't have those reports. They didn't have pictures or video. So unfortunately he's not representing them, but he's got 120 and let's get into some of those. So 120 victims had over 3000 of them saying they were coming forward. And he announced this on October 1st. So we just heard from Tony like a couple weeks ago. So the first thing that he told us, and this was in a press conference that this Tony Busby did, he said one of the victims was a nine-year-old little boy, nine years old. He said that it was at the Bad Boys Records um, that all these kids around the same age wanted to get with Diddy and, you know, basically become stars, that he was going to take them under his wing. They were going to become, you know, the next Justin Bieber. And the parents were all bringing their kids willingly to these events that Diddy had. What this nine-year-old says was that he was trying to land the record deal that Diddy told him and his parents that he had everything it took to become this big star and that they were going to get a record deal. Um, and then unfortunately, he sexually assaulted him. Now, there isn't a lot of details because this was just given at the press conference that Tony Busby did. So that's all we really know about this particular situation. We don't have um, the like court records or anything from that yet. The filing has not been put in. He was just leading up to what's coming. Here's the other thing he said. He also said that there's going to be a bunch, and he used the word bunch, <laughs> a bunch of famous people going to be sued. Now, he has also claimed that they've already sent demand letters to most of these celebrities. And basically what he's doing, unfortunately, is giving them the chance to settle out of court with these victims, and then they won't have their names released. I hate that that's happening, but apparently that is common practice when you have a sexual assault case, because if the alleged perpetrator doesn't want their name out of that out there, then they won't go to court. It saves the victim from having their name out, having to go to court. You know, they get money um, to try and make up for whatever they went through. Um, and then they're not exposed to like these celebrities. So they, a lot of them will settle, unfortunately, out of court, whether they're guilty or not. I bet they'll settle. Anywho, this is all coming out. Tony warned us October 1st, this is what's coming. And then October 14th is when he dropped six of them. So he's got 120, but he's slowly dropping them, right? He's slowly releasing them and he can't file them all at once. It's so much work, as you can imagine, to investigate it, but he's ready for six of them. So what he said is that he's also, besides these individuals that are going forward and pressing charges, that he's also going after corporate entities like hotels and stores and places that did he have these parties. He's going after everybody. He also said that he's going to name the corporate entities and he's already named um, a Marriott that he's going after in New York for one of the victims. Um, and there was somebody else that he named as well. Oh, Bad Boy Records. He's going after Bad Boy Records as well. So he's going after these corporate entities, um, and any of the, the famous people that are involved in this. He filed six lawsuits on October 14th. So I'm going to go through briefly, um, at least four of these lawsuits with you because four of them were from men, two were from women. So I'm going to tell you about the four men who were involved in these lawsuits so far. So the first one, this is a man who worked for Echo Clothing. Do you guys remember Echo? So he worked for Echo Clothing Brand in 2008. And this is when Diddy was also doing his um, Sean John brand, if you guys remember, which was a competition for the Echo brand as well. So they were competitors. So this guy who filed said that he knew Diddy through work, like he was dealing with Echo and he was, you know, pretty involved in it. He says that he ran into Diddy and three bodyguards unfortunately, in a stock room at Macy's. And this is what he's alleging. He says that he was pistol whipped in the back of the head to the point where he, he fell to his knees and his hands and knees. And then Diddy steps in and says to him, I don't know if I can say this on here. I'm just going to, I'm just going to bleep it out. So it, he said, suck my D echo, like the, the clothing brand, and basically forced this man to perform on him. So this was, this was the first lawsuit. And remember what I said, Busby didn't take on any of these cases unless there was crazy evidence, like pictures, videos, you know, anything that could prove that this actually happened. So we'll wait and see what this guy had. The second case, 
This man said that he was hired as a security guard in 2006 at one of Diddy's white parties. These white parties seem to be like a spawn of these allegations. It's awful. So he says that while he was working at this party, he consumed a drink that was given to him. And obviously it was laced with something because the next thing he knows, he's being forced into a van by Diddy. So Diddy has left the party. He's outside the party, forces this man into his van. And he says he was basically overpowered because of whatever he was given. And he says that Diddy uh, had his way with him in the van. Like assaulted him. You can, you, there's a lot more words in here and you can imagine what I'm getting at. I can't say them on here, I'm sure. The third man, here's the third charge, or suit, sorry. Um, this man went to Diddy's party, again, the white party. He was actually a guest um, in October of 2021. He says that he became extremely disorientated after one drink. Huge theme here. All of these victims are saying after one drink or one haul on something, they were completely out of it. So GHB, ecstasy, whatever is happening, we don't know, but it's something and it's something bad. He says that the room started spinning. Next thing that he remembers is he was in a bedroom and he was basically paralyzed. He said he couldn't lift his limbs. He was just completely out of it. He says at least three men assaulted him while he was in this room on this bed. Three men. And he says he specifically remembers looking up and seeing a naked Diddy above him. So he knows 100% that he, he says Diddy was one of the, the men doing this. The next man, the fourth man from these six um, lawsuits that came forward, this man says he was 16 years old, invited to a white party yet again. This one was in the Hamptons and it was in 1998. 16 years old, he said that Diddy took a big liking to him, um, chatted him up saying like, oh yeah, you've got a really good look. You look like you could make it in the music industry. Again, they're all wanting to be the next Justin Bieber, right? Ended up at this time taking him to more private area because he said he wanted to talk to him. Once he got into the, the private area, he started talking him right up saying, you know what? I'm going to make you a star. I'm going to take you under my wing. This is it. Told him to drop his pants. And the kid thought he was joking. And he's like, what? And he's like, no, no. This is like, you know, things we do. This is like, what's the wording he used? He said, uh, a rite of passage. That's what Diddy told him it was. It's a rite of passage for all the people that he signs. So the kid's like, okay. So he drops his pants and he said immediately Diddy started like fondling him, cupping him and touching him inappropriately. So that's the next suit. Now, the, my sister's dogs. The next thing that ended up coming forward. So those were the six cases. Two of them were females. We don't have much detail on that yet. Four were men. The next thing that happened was just recently. This woman is another Jane Doe. She did, she did not want to be named in this suit. Um, she's from Tennessee. She said she was 19 years old in 2004 when this took place. 19. She says that she got invited to a photo shoot because it was across the street. She was a freshman in, in college. She said it was across the street from her college in Brooklyn, New York. She saw it happening. They were all excited. They were kind of watching. She gets invited to come join, so she brings a friend with her. The two of them go over. They're watching the photo shoot, um, taking part, having a great time. And then Diddy invites her back to the Marriott. This is where the Marriott comes in, right, as the corporate ent entity, entity that's now being sued takes her back to the, the um, a Marriott in the Manhattan area for an after party. She says someone brought, brought the girls um, together. She brought her friend with her. So she says that when the girls got there, her and her friend, they all these people were in the hotel. And so she says they were trying to like mingle in like on the floor of the hotel with all these people that were there and stuff. And she says the people that brought her, these security guards were like, no, no, you're coming with us. So they weren't even allowed to like mingle with the rest of the guests. She says that they were brought to um, a bedroom, locked in the hotel room and told to wait for Diddy. Diddy arrives, goes in the room with them. And she says that there was um, white powder, if you know what I'm saying, on a coffee table. And he was trying to force them to, to do it. And they didn't want to. They'd never done it before. Um, and they didn't want to. So he was giving them a drink which I'm sure was probably laced, as you can imagine. Um, so they did do that, but he was getting more and more mad that they were refusing to do the white powder. 
And she says that Diddy started groping them aggressively because they were resisting. She says that um, he then ordered her friend to perform oral on him. And the friend's crying. She's crying. They're super upset. They're trying to say no. And now he's threatening their life. Basically, the friend caves in, does it. They think this is over. They're like, please let us go. He refuses and says that he's going to kill them both um, if if they try and leave uh, and keep at it, trying asking to leave. So again, the friend complies. They're thinking it's done. Then he makes her get undressed, the, the girl who's filed the suit. He makes her get undressed. He undressed. He pins her down on the bed and he starts assaulting her. Now, she thinks because of her cries is why a security guard comes in. But a security guard comes in, opens the door, says he has to talk to Diddy. Diddy leaves the room. And as Diddy's trying to get out, the, her friend bolts. So her friend runs out. But this girl's now scared. And Diddy says to her, I'm going to kill you if you get off the bed. So he leaves the room and she said she was absolutely terrified. So she says she stayed there because she was so scared for 30 minutes. And she said another security guard eventually came to the room, opened the door and said, you can leave. So she grabs her clothes and takes off. So she basically has come forward, but she also has this friend. And we don't know yet if the friend's going to file or if she's just going to be a witness. But there was another person involved in that situation. Now, Bad Boy Records, like I said, and the Marriott is being sued and is listed in these papers um, from Tony Busby as well. He says that they basically looked the other way when all this was going on. He says there's no way this hotel didn't know this was happening when like basically a floor of your hotel is dealing with this situation. So th they're going to have to be held accountable as well. Now, the next thing that comes forward or happens, I should say. So Diddy appeared in court just this past October 10th, and he got his trial date. So Diddy's trial is now set for May 5th, which a lot of people are saying is probably too soon. They think that the prosecution's going to put something in to extend that because they are just now starting to get the stuff off his phones. They said it's going to take at least a month to get all the data off the phones. There's so much. You can imagine the video recordings that they've got saved on these devices. Anywho, we're guessing May 5th, may not happen but as of right now the date is as is listed as may 5th and he's going to be in prison until then because he's been denied bond denied bond make sure you hit follow i will definitely be updating with anything new that comes out here's the next thing we've got our court date um and then another lawsuit just this past week came forward and this lawsuit guys is not from busby so the 120 cases that came forward this isn't included. This is another legal team that has put this one forward. Um, and this one, this one is crazy. I'm going to preface this with saying this one is something that I think it's like out of the movies. I don't even know if you could make a movie about this because it sounds so crazy. But here we go. Okay. So this case is by Ashley Parham. Ashley has put her name out there. She didn't name herself as a John Doe. She actually wants a jury trial. I don't think she's going to settle in this. I think she's taken this the whole way. She said, it sounds like anyway, she's got some major receipts and we'll get into that. Here's what happened. Here's what she's saying. Okay. She is saying this all took place in 2018. She says she met a friend of Diddy's, um, somewhere out and about at a bar. And she says that the friend is like talking himself up, name dropping. He's like, I'm buddies with Diddy. She said she told him she wasn't impressed, didn't really believe him. He FaceTimes Diddy. She sees Diddy on there and she makes a comment to Diddy. She said she wasn't impressed and she made a comment that she believes he had something to do with Tupac's death. Tons of people think that. She unfortunately said it to him. She said that he got extremely mad and basically told her you're going to regret that comment. So she's like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know, and that's the end of that. A month later, the same friend who was like, I'm friends with Diddy, FaceTimed him. That friend contacts her and says, hey, I'm having people over. Come on over to my place in California. And unfortunately, she did. It was a complete setup. This friend set her up to be attacked by Diddy. So here, here's the logistics of what she's saying. Guys, I'm, again, it's crazy. It's, it's, this is nuts. All right, so she says... Again, Diddy told her she was going to regret this comment. It's now a month later. She's been invited to this man's house. So she heads over. She says while she's there, 
Diddy shows up and he's got an entourage with him. She says he shows up, he holds a knife apparently to the side of her face and he tells her, basically, I'm gonna give you a Glasgow smile for that comment. Guys, I don't know what that is. So if you know what that is, drop it in the comment, but I should have looked it up. A Glasgow smile, I'm assuming it means like, you know, gonna cut, cut her face. I've heard that before, it's sick. Yeah, what is it guys? A scar from ear to ear. Okay, so that's what he told her, like the Joker. That that's, This is what he says to her. Um, she then says that Christina Corum, I think is how we say her last name, it's Diddy's top consultant, or it was at that time. Apparently she was there. Th this just blows me away that the, uh, this many people are seeing all this stuff. So... She says that this Christina tells Diddy, no, 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 don't cut her face because we could actually sell her to clients for sex. This comes out of Diddy's top consultant's mouth. Not good. Not good for Christina. Um, she is then threatened and told to strip off, to take her clothes off, or she's never going to see her family again. Again, there's an entourage there, not just Diddy. And Diddy's got this knife. So she says, Diddy holds the knife to her. She gets her clothes off. Then he takes the knife off. And she says, Diddy gets this large um, fanny pack and pulls out what she called a mysterious liquid, a bottle of mysterious liquid. We all pretty much know now it's baby oil. She says he gets it out and lathers her all up in it. She said she was covered in this, this liquid. And then she says that Christina and Diddy tried to insert something into her vagina. She says that they told her it was some sort of IUD and then it, it malfunctioned and they weren't able to use it. Like, I, I don't, I can't even wrap my head around what that could be, but this is what she's, she's saying happened. She says then, because this malfunctioned or whatever, that Diddy grabbed a TV remote and inserted that inside of her and started violently using it as a tool to, to do this to her. Um, she said once he finished doing that to her, guys, I'm so sorry, this is so disturbing. But anyway, once he finished doing that to her, she says um, that he later did the same thing to her, but from behind and that he instructed two other people that were there with him in this entourage of his friends that showed up to do the same thing to her. So two of them also did it to her from behind and then someone else did it vaginally to her. So she was, it was like a gang situation again. So they all did this to her. Now here is where it gets even more crazy and it's a lot guys. So she says that once this happened, they basically left her lying there. They had also given her drugs as well. Left her lying there. She was weak. She was limp. She was out of it. They go outside, she says, and start smoking joints and cigarettes. She then grabs a t-shirt and the knife that Diddy had used, and she tries to escape, but she has to go by them because they're right outside. So she says she goes by Diddy Caesar, and he says this to her. She says... um, that he was shocked and he goes, holy, I gave her enough drugs to take out a horse, was his comment. So she says that he then offered, once, once he sees that this has happened, he grabs her and he offers um, to give her money to stay quiet and say it's consensual. And of course, she's like freaking out and saying no. She says that he then threatens her family and says, I've dealt with bigger people than you. And he drops, including Tupac. When he does this, she says one of the guys that's there with him, one of these entourage people, gets pissed at the Tupac comment. And he pulls out a gun, and then Diddy's freaking out, and Diddy apparently starts to run away. I'm t I told you this is nuts. The guy fires the gun. Diddy's now running, and she says she flips out. She still has the knife, so she chases Diddy down, she says, and basically attacks him. She says, Diddy's pleading for his life. So she says, she comes around. She's like, what am I doing? So she gets up and she tries to leave again, like get out and be, be done with it. 
and then he chases her. So now Diddy's chasing her again. And she says that at this point, they're back in the house. And again, she can't leave because all of this is happening. And he's threatening that he's going to kill her. And she says that at this point, he's threatening his her family and shows a video of what appears to be her sister's home and they're live streaming. Someone's at her sister's home live streaming from the house apparently and they show her this to threaten her family like this is nuts this is nuts then she claims that diddy gets on his cell phone and calls janice calls his mother so she says that janice combs gets called and that diddy's like this girl's here threatening me mom she's trying to hurt me and janice is like on speakerphone yelling at the girl you leave my son alone and like this is nuts so she says this is all happening she's freaking out she says that um, at this point, he's like out of it, dealing with his mom, whatever. Um, and she ends up escaping. She runs out the front door. She said she started screaming as loud as she could on the front lawn for someone to call police because there was neighbors. Someone did. Someone called police. And she says that a sheriff actually showed up at the home. And as the um, as she's out there screaming, did he realize what was going on? So she says she did hear him squeal away in his SUV. This She waits, the sheriff shows up, but she says she doesn't believe the sheriff investigated. So she says that she went to two different police departments. Again, this is all, all her saying, right? And hopefully there's gonna be documentation for this. She says she goes to two different police stations and nobody opened a case. Like, I, you can't make this up. This is nuts. She says that, Neither of them made a case. So she ended up at the police station. Um, so there supposedly should be some sort of evidence, but it was never investigated. That has to be the craziest lawsuit I think I've ever heard. Like that is nuts. Now, Diddy has since, and his legal team, filed legal papers claiming that the feds are not letting him defend himself or make a proper defense because a lot of these victims are anonymous that the feds have brought forward. So Diddy wants all of the ID'd anonymous people or unID'd, the um, anonymous names to be revealed to his legal team because he says that he's got voluminous evidence that it's all consensual sex and consensual partying. If he can find out what the names are. This is what he's now saying. So this is what we have so far on the case. This is all the stuff that's been coming out. There is new stuff every day. Make sure you have follow because I'm, <laughs> thank you, Serene. I'm definitely going to be covering this. Um, it, it's crazy. I think we're going to hear a lot more before the trial date, May 5th, if it even goes on May 5th. Um, but basically that's what we know so far. I'm coming to your comments, guys, because I haven't been able to read one of them since I've been on here. Why does he need the names of 